hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works forty years. Therefore I was angry with them, with that generation, and said that they always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is still called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, while it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now, this is the second of five great warnings in the book of Hebrews. I imagine we've talked about that before. Uh, this is the longest of the warnings, and whenever we read a warning, we ought to ask, what is it warning against? And I'm going to suggest that we can find the theme of this if we look at just a few words scattered throughout the passage I've read. Notice the first word, therefore. Uh, and then, at the beginning of verse 12, beware, brethren, and at the very end of verse 19, because of unbelief. Now, if we put all of that together, therefore, as the, uh, excuse me, therefore, beware, brethren, because of unbelief. That is the warning. And the, the idea of unbelief here is particularly important. Now, there is this debate about uh, to whom the book of Hebrews is written. Uh, there are two camps. It doesn't seem to matter whether you're from the Assemblies or a Baptist church or a Presbyterian or a Bible church. It doesn't matter whether you're Calvinistic or non-Calvinistic. There's one group that says the book of Hebrews was written exclusively to Christians. Um, faithful Christians and backslidden Christians. There's another group of people that says, well, yeah, it was written to Hebrews, Jewish people, but three groups, faithful Christians, backslidden condition, uh, Christians, and then people who are not Christians at all. Now, uh, I tend to fall into that second group, but when we come to this passage, I'm gonna teach it as though I fall into the first group. Now, there's a couple reasons for that. I think that this passage is primarily dedicated to those who believe. If you take a look at verse 12, it says, Beware, brethren. Now, there are some that argue when the writer says brethren, he is referring to all Jewish people. It's a secular brethrenism. Uh, I don't quite see it that way here. Um, and then in verse 14, for we have become partakers of Christ. Uh, there's another reason why I'm going to treat it as though it's speaking to believers. That is because I assume I'm speaking to a believing audience tonight. And uh, therefore, we as Christians need these warnings. Now, if you're here in the audience and you're not a believer, you need to think very, very carefully about the warning that the book of Hebrews has to you. Uh, it's a very dangerous thing to learn about the Lord Jesus Christ, to realize that he is God's provision for your sin, that he's the Savior, and then turn your back on him. A very dangerous thing to do. Now, the first word, therefore, uh, it points backwards. Uh, I believe to everything that has been said in the book of Hebrews so far. Because Jesus Christ is the superior method of God's revelation to this earth, because Jesus Christ is superior to anything you find in the Old Testament, any ritual, any person, uh, because Jesus Christ is superior to people like Moses that you looked at last time, uh, what should we do? If Christ is who the author says he is, therefore, let us do something. And what is the thing that we ought to do? Well, again, verse 12, beware. And what are we to beware of? Again, the end of verse 19, unbelief. It's a very dangerous thing to say that we believe in God, we believe in the Word of God, meaning the Bible today, 
that we believe Jesus Christ is the Savior, but then act in faith as though we don't believe. To illustrate and to emphasize his warning, the writer of Hebrews, beginning in the middle of verse 7, reaches back in Psalm 95, which in turn reaches back to Exodus 17 and Numbers 20, to talk about or to give an illustration of what happens to people who don't believe, people that are nominally God's children. And uh, we'll take a look at that in a bit. Uh, you probably know the story in Exodus uh, chapter 17, verses 2 to 7, uh, actually a little further than that. But uh, the, the people of Israel in their wandering comes to a place called Rephidim. There's no water. They begin to complain and grumble and murmur and strive with God, contend with God. And God did provide water, but he called the place, and Moses called the place Meribah, which means strife and contending. You read about that same event in Numbers chapter 20. And, uh, there's several verses there. Verse 13 is probably the one that people would go to most often. And if you want to know what happens to people who don't believe, take a look at all these corpses in the wilderness. Uh, Robert Louis Stevenson wrote a book called Treasure Island. He wrote it for teenage boys primarily. Uh, in that book, he has a group of sailors on board a ship called the Hispaniola. And uh, there's a captain by the name of Smollett, and uh, they have made a fair amount of money on this particular voyage, and the crew doesn't like the fact that the captain and the officers are going to make a lot more money than the sailors will. And the sailors are grumbling, and they say, you know, we work just as hard, we risk danger just as frequently as they did. It's not fair that they get a lion's share of the profits. And so how do we get our share? Well, we've got to do away with the captain and the officers. And then the question is, well, what do we do with them? Some people suggested putting them on a desert island. Uh, and then one sailor pipes up and he says, dead men don't bite. What he meant by that, and the way it's usually quoted today, dead men tell no tales. Uh, in other words, they won't be able to say what happened to them and why it happened to them and all that. The writer of Hebrews, like Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, would argue differently. He says, dead men do tell tales. Let's take a look at that wilderness in the southwestern part of Saudi Arabia. Uh, let's take a look at all of these bodies and see what they would say to us by way of illustration. Now, that's the context of our passage. Now, to introduce this uh, almost a second time, I want to invite you to keep your finger here, but go back to Jeremiah chapter 2. In Jeremiah 2, I'm going to begin reading at verse 10. And there, Jeremiah says, God to Jeremiah, for pass beyond the coasts of Cyprus and sea, send to Kedar and consider diligently and see if there's been such a thing. In other words, look all over the Middle East, and you're not going to see anything as surprising as what I'm about to describe. And then verse 11, has a nation changed its gods, which are not gods, notice it's lowercase g, but my people have changed their glory, capital G, for what does not profit. Be astonished, O heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, says the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. God is saying this is such an astonishing thing. Uh, take a look at these nations, these pagan people that worship gods that have no power. Uh, they never help the people that worship them. And yet, these people won't abandon those gods for a new god, for a god that seemingly can do something. Why? Well, it may be tradition. It may be their heritage. Uh, they still go to the same temples. They still have the same statues in their homes. And uh, they're dedicated to that. And yet, I am a God that has done marvelous things for the nation of Israel. I've brought you out of Egypt in a miraculous way. I parted the Dead Sea, one of the most amazing events ever to take place in the history of the universe. You've seen me defeat your enemies, and yet, what's your response? You're willing to abandon me for something that doesn't profit you at the end of verse 11. That is an astonishing thing. It's astonishing to God. It ought to be astonishing to Israel. It ought to be astonishing to us today. And uh, 
we're careless about these things. Uh, this is a real God. This is an exciting God. This is a powerful God. This is an all-present God. Um, uh, the Lord is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Do we see him that way? Do we appreciate him that way? Or do we think he's a boring person that's way off in heaven somewhere and we don't have access to him? Sometimes that's the way we feel. Um, I have five kids, two daughters. The youngest of those daughters, when she was in high school, uh, didn't particularly care for school. She did okay. I think to this day that she did okay because uh, she's got a great personality, the, the best of all of my kids. And uh, everybody just loved her, including the teacher. But uh, one afternoon before supper, I was working with her on history. And uh, then during supper, I was trying to convince her of the beauty of a certain algebraic equation that we were going to be working on in her homework after supper. And right in the middle, she had a fork and knife in her hand at the time, and she just dropped them and folded her arms across her chest and said, Dad, you are so boring. And uh, I think she feels that way to this day. Um, but that's the way we sometimes treat God. He's dull. Uh, his word is not very exciting. Uh, time spent in prayer with him doesn't seem that meaningful. Uh, is that our attitude toward God? And the problem for the people being addressed here is they were convinced that Jesus Christ was real, that the gospel was real, that God was everything he said he was, but they were careless about it. And as I said previously, acted and believed as though God's word wasn't to be taken seriously. Go back to chapter 2 and verse 1. I realize I'm repeating things you've already studied, but it says, Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Uh, not deliberately run away, but just carelessly drift away. And maybe somebody mentioned this, but it's the picture of a, a ring that is too large for the finger that it's on. And somebody is using their hands to help them talk, and the ring just slips off, and you don't even notice it. It just slips away. And that's what's happening to these people in Israel. They are under some persecution. Uh, they've got a lot of things that they're worried about, and it just carelessly passes away. Now, that's very true of us today. Think about all of the things that we're involved in. Uh, a lot of you are still working. A lot of you have families that you're concerned about. You have the assembly activities. You have neighborhood activities. You have your hobbies and whatever else it is that you're involved in. And you're trying to balance in your arms all of these events and things and even toys and uh, packages and bags. I'm speaking metaphorically here. And sometimes some of those things just slip through the cracks. They fall through our fingers. And you've heard that phrase. And uh, there is a, a verse out of the hymn. The title of the hymn is Jesus Loves Even Me. And the second verse, though I forget him and wander away, still he doth love me wherever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms would I flee when I remember that Jesus loves me. That's a summary of this passage. Uh, I'm not trying to run away. I wander away and uh, tend to forget him. And we shouldn't be doing this. But the writer of Hebrews is addressing these people. They evidently lost their initial enthusiasm for the Lord Jesus Christ. They failed to progress in spiritual understanding and discernment. Uh, they were becoming more lazy and discouraged. Uh, they'd even be done to question whether they should remain in Christianity or revert back to Judaism and the ways and practices of that, the old ways and traditions. They'd learned the gospel, been convinced of its relevance, its truthfulness, and then not embraced it. And uh, that's a temptation for a lot of people. Are we going to leave Christianity and go back to where we were before we were saved? And so in the flow of the thought of this argument, uh, he pulls off to the side of the road periodically through the book of Hebrews and gives us warnings. And as I said at the outset, this is the longest of the five warnings there. And the author points to the Lord Jesus Christ as the perfect revelation of God. 
no matter who you compare him to, no matter what you compare him to, he comes out better. And if that's the case, there's no reason to go back in any way, shape, or form. Now, what's the value of a passage like this for us today? We face trials, we face difficulties and tribulations and uh, all of that. And uh, by focusing on the better things, the Lord Jesus Christ, we can persevere. Now, again, if you're not a Christian, uh, the call here is to believe and to commit while there's still time, while it is still called today. And if we are a believer, how faithful are we? Do we live, think, act as though we really do believe? Keep in mind the last phrase of this passage, because of unbelief. Are we faithful in prayer? Are we faithful in Bible reading? Are we faithful in witnessing? Are we faithful in serving? Are we faithful in our attendance at the meetings? Think of the Lord Jesus Christ. We talked about this this morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Great. What adjective would you use to describe your faithfulness? Adequate? Meager? Inconsistent? Well, this warning is for us. Now, there's a number of ways to approach this passage. Uh, I'm going to do it by looking at four aspects of this warning. Uh, what should we be looking at? What should we be worried about? Number one, I think the author is telling us, pay attention to the word of God. Notice the way this passage opens again. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you will hear his voice. Now let me stop there, even though it's right in the middle of the sentence, because I think there is so much here about living the Christian life. And again, I think I'm speaking to Christians. Uh, by and large, pay attention to the word of God, even the Old Testament. It's all important to us. If you want to live a life that brings glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, to God himself, we need to pay attention to that word. Now he's going to give us two reasons for this. Number one, because of who the author is. Notice again, as the Holy Spirit says, and here the author is saying, look, this is not just the psalmist. And you know this is a quote from Psalm 95. I assume I probably should have mentioned that earlier. Uh, this warning, uh, the author of Hebrews reaches back to Psalm 95, which in turn reaches back to Exodus and Numbers. Um, he says, look, if you reject this, uh, you're not just rejecting a preacher, a parent, a Sunday school teacher, you're rejecting God himself. You're rejecting the Holy Spirit. And, uh, this is not just something about the history of Israel. This is something that has to do with Christians. It's the Holy Spirit speaking through the psalm to believers. And again, the author, Holy Spirit. Now, look at chapter 4 and verse 7. For he has spoken in a certain place of this, whoops, yeah, uh, verse 7, I'm reading verse 4. Uh, verse 7, again, he designates a certain day, saying to David, today, after such a long time, as it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. The same quotation. In chapter 4 and verse 7, the author ascribes it to David. In chapter 3 and verse 7, he ascribes it to the Holy Spirit. What is it? Well, here we have the doctrine of divine inspiration. Uh, we learn that the Holy Spirit moves men to write, and he does it in such a way that these men write down perfectly, exactly, God's word, what God wants us to have. And uh, so again, if you say no to the Holy Spirit, say no to God. Uh, it's a monumental thing to say no to God. Uh, to harden your heart, to turn from the Lord Jesus Christ. And then notice the tense of this. It's not the Holy Spirit has said, or the Holy Spirit will say, but rather the Holy Spirit says. It is present tense. Uh, what the Holy Spirit says in the Old Testament, he is still saying in the New Testament, he is still saying today. In eternity, the Holy Spirit will still speak. You remember, I'm sure, Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 3, these seven letters to the churches. At the end of every one, it says, Let him who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit 
says, present tense, to the churches. The Holy Spirit is speaking today through his word, just like the Lord Jesus did 2,000 years ago. So we want to pay attention to the word of God, number one, because of the author. Number two, because of the relevance of the word for today. Again, that word says, present tense, and you'll notice that you'll repeat it if you look in verse 15, uh, and then in chapter 4, he's going to do it again. He's not speaking about something that just happened a long time ago on the other side of the world. These words are for you. By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they're for you, so that we can know how to live the Christian life. And the Holy Spirit speaks today with the same power, with the same truth, and just as much clarity as he did through David when Psalm 95 was first written. God is speaking to your heart and my heart whenever the Bible is opened and read, whenever you read it for yourself. And so if we want to live the Christian life right, the first thing we need to see is that the author of Hebrews says, heed the Bible including the Old Testament. There's a second part of this warning, and that is pay attention to the warnings of the Word of God. Pay attention to the Word of God, pay attention to the warnings. And uh, this warning is for you, Christian, and the unbelief and the rebellion of Israel and the wilderness, learn from that. And if you're gonna live the Christian life, pay attention to these warnings. And it's not to be a discouragement, but rather an encouragement to lead this. Now again, there are two reasons for this part, this aspect of the warning. Number one, because of the cause of this warning, and it's unbelief. Uh, take a look at verse 9, where your fathers tested me, tried me, saw my works 40 years, and then this word again, therefore. Now, the context uh, helps us to find it a little bit differently than the open word uh, in verse 7, but therefore. I was angry with that generation. That's why we need to pay attention to this warning. And then verse 19 at the very end, because of unbelief. The children of Israel get out into the wilderness. They've been miraculously delivered from bondage and slavery. Uh, they go from Egypt to the freedom of God's promise. And they go to the promised land. Why is it called the promised land? Well, it's because God promised it. It's his word. And if you get out there in the wilderness and say, I don't know that God is going to take care of us. I don't know that God can provide water. I don't know that God can take care of my uh, child or my food that needs to be on the table next week, next year. I've got a mortgage. I'm worried about that. I don't know that God can supply my need here. You're not believing God. You're not believing the promises of God. And that's what happened to these people here. They're out in the wilderness, it's hot, it's hard, they're scared. And what do they start to do? They grumble. They grumble against God and they grumble against Moses. And they begin to say, you know, we had it so good in Egypt. Now think about what they're saying. Uh, it was so great to be a slave. Uh, it was great being beat up by somebody. It was great not getting paid for the work that we did. Uh, it was great being mistreated. It was just so wonderful. I wish I was back in Egypt. Now, think how foolish that sounds. But what about some of the things that we say? And what does God say in response to this? Not one member of this generation is going to enter my rest. Only Joshua and Caleb out of everybody. You don't trust me. You don't believe my promises. You don't believe my providences. Uh, you don't believe the good news of my bringing you out of Egypt, that I was going to give you the promised land. It's because of your unbelief that you're not going to enter in. Now, uh, let me pull off to the side of the road for a minute and uh, say one thing that I think is quite important. It's, I think, essential that we understand how these warnings work, what they're about, why they're here. The writer of Hebrews, <clears throat> excuse me, is not trying to unsettle the sensitive and serious Christians who are engaged in what I'll call a normal fight with sin. 
If you're a Christian, you will struggle with the desire to sin. Uh, some people, when they fall to sin, they say, am I really a Christian? And they hear these warnings and say, well, maybe I've fallen away from the faith. Uh, maybe my, etern my salvation is not secure. Uh, that's not what this writer is doing. But when you begin the Christian life, you'll be in that fight of sin until the day you die. And the fact that you are in a fight is evidence not that you're not a Christian, but evidence that you are a Christian. What's the attitude of a non-Christian? Uh, the only fight they have is to find more of that sin. They're not bothered by it. Their conscience doesn't convict them. Um, and the only thing they worry about, where can I get more of it? Uh, if you weren't a Christian, there wouldn't be that struggle within you. The Holy Spirit has changed your heart, given you new priorities, and uh, again, he's not trying to discourage sensitive and serious Christians, sincere Christians. Uh, this is just a normal state of the Christian life. We want to become more like Christ. Uh, we want to get to the point where certain things don't tempt us, where we don't fall when we are tempted. But until we get to heaven, it will be a battle. And, uh, it's because we're alive by the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit that we're fighting against sin. So the author of Hebrews is to warn those who are considering turning their backs on Jesus and trying to find their hope somewhere else. And even Christians can try to find their hope in their occupation, in their investments, in their education, a lot of other things. So we want to beware of the warnings, number one, because of the cause of these warnings, and that's unbelief. We don't take God seriously when he speaks. We read the Bible. Uh, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added on you. But again, then we live as though that's not true. Secondly, we want to heed this warning, and warnings in general, because of the consequences. And again, there are two of those that are listed here. Number one, uh, the fact that they will find no rest. Look at the end of verse 7, and then in the middle of verse 18. God is preparing these people for rest. And notice whose rest it is. It is God's rest, not a rest we've prepared for ourselves. And what God makes, what God prepares, is far better than anything that we could plan, that we could come up with. It's his rest. In this context, the rest was Canaan. Now think about these people wandering the wilderness. They're wandering. They never had a permanent home, never had a permanent farm, never had a permanent business. There was never a chance to settle down and uh, put down roots. You couldn't start a business and so forth because you were always packing up and moving on. Um, wandering. Um, he prepared a rest from the wilderness. And think about that. This wilderness, if you look at the picture of where it was that they walked, it is a very barren land. Apart from the occasional oasis, there was no greenery whatsoever. It didn't produce crops. It wasn't suitable for grazing. And for the most part, it was a hostile environment. Overly hot at night, quite cool during their, hot during the day and cool at night. And God said, look, this promised land, this place called Canaan, a very pleasant place. All kinds of pasture land, it'll produce abundantly. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. He also prepared a rest from weariness. Now, when I thought about that, I, it struck me that if you study the wanderings, the people of Israel moved from point to point to point. Sometimes they would stay for a week sometimes for probably a month, we get the sense, it doesn't say specifically, sometimes they stayed in one place for an entire year. All they have to do is go out every morning, collect the manna, and that's it. Uh, sit outside on your lounge chair and enjoy the sun. Now we might think, what a brilliant way to live. But talk to somebody that has a debilitating disease that doesn't allow them to get out and do very much. It is a weary, life when that's the case. God has said, I've come to give my sheep life 
and not only life, but abundant life. You read that in John 10, 10. So again, because of the consequence. Um, secondly, the first consequence, of course, is no rest. The second consequence is death. Uh, take a look at um, the idea of corpses here. In the end of verse 17, whose corpses fell in the wilderness. Now, again, uh, think about what the Israelites did. They get to the Jordan River. They look across the river. They can see what God has for them. They send in 10 spies, and they all come back and say, yeah, this land is amazing. Take a look at the size of the fruit. Uh, let me describe the pasture land for you. It is rich. Ten of them, however, said, yeah, but it's occupied by these giants. And there's no way even God is going to be able to give this land to us. Only Joshua and Caleb came back and said, yeah, look what God is presenting to us. What was the response from God? Again, he said, all right, you're going to wander because of your unbelief. You're all going to die. Nobody's going to enter in. If you don't want it, okay, I'll give you that. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, somewhat of a parallel passage here, and if I could get to it quickly, uh, in verse 5 of that chapter, uh, in the previous verses, verse 2, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. They ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink. They were all blessed, in other words, blessed abundantly. And then verse 5, but, and it goes on to say, with most of them, God was not well pleased. For, here's the evidence of his displeasure, their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Can you imagine a 12 year old girl going to her mother and asking, why are all these people dying? Uh, why are all of these gravestones set up throughout the wilderness? And the mother would have to look back and say, well, unfortunately it's our own fault. We didn't believe God's promise about the promised land. And because of that, we're being punished. Now keep your finger here. I do want to take you back to Romans chapter one. Romans chapter 1. In verse 21, I'm going to sort of jump around here a little bit. I want to read verse 21 and then go back and establish the context. Notice, because although they knew God, that's what Hebrews is about, right? People who knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darken. Now, let's go back to verse 18. This is the context. For the wrath of God is revealed. Why is that wrath revealed? Verse 19, because what may be known of God, in other words, they've got the knowledge, and he talks about creation and uh, conscience and all of that sort of thing. Verse 21, uh, well, verse 24, you could put because there, uh, they've got evidence. Verse 21, because they knew God. So over and over again, they know, they can see in nature, they knew God, and what did they do? Turn their back, and then verse 24, therefore God also gave them up to do what it was they wanted to do. And again, I don't want to get political here, but what's going on today? People say they don't want God, they don't want to obey the commandments of God, they don't want to follow the philosophies of God, the morality of God. And I wonder if God isn't saying, if that's the way you want it, I'll give you what you want. And then listen to people complain. Look at their attitude and so forth. And again, Hebrews 3, that's what they're going through. So, aspect number one of this warning, pay attention to the word of God, all of the word of God. Aspect number two, pay attention to the warnings of God. And then number three, pay attention to the danger of unbelief. We see it in verse 12. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. And then verse 19, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. That's the third aspect of this warning. And what's the root sin in all of scripture? What's the foundational sin, the master sin? 
that led the children of Israel into disobedience, that leads us into disobedience, people stop believing God. Stop believing his promises, his providence, as I've said before. Stop believing his good news. They lost faith. Now let's go back to the Garden of Eden for a moment. Um, you know the promise that God gave to Adam and Eve? Uh, here's this abundant garden. There are thousands of trees here. Help yourself to all of the fruit that you can see. But just to let you know that I'm God, I'm still in charge. There's one tree here. You can't eat from that tree. Now, we would think what an insignificant thing. One tree out of hundreds, thousands, who knows how many? One tree. But what does Satan do? He takes that one tree and, again, metaphorically speaking, drags it right in front of the porch of Adam and Eve. So every morning when they wake up and sit out on the front porch with their coffee, what do they see? That tree that they can't eat from. And Satan says, you know, you heard God's word. You know, he said, in the day that you eat it, you shall surely die. Is God the kind of God that would kill you for something simple like that? You don't believe that, do you? And then, I'm reading into this, of course. If I were in charge here, I wouldn't restrict you at all. I'm a nice guy. I want you to enjoy everything. God is kind of a mean ogre if he's not going to let you eat of that fruit. And what did Adam and Eve do? They ate the fruit. Now ask yourself, if you really believed that if you ate something, you would die, would you ever eat it? Well, we know the answer is no. So the conclusion we have to come to is that Adam and Eve didn't believe what God had to say. Now sometimes we talk about the unpardonable sin. And maybe you've got a slightly different view of this than I do, but I think it's pretty clear in scripture that the unpardonable sin is unbelief in Jesus Christ. The only sin that can't be forgiven is the sin of rejecting him as your savior. In John chapter 16, the Lord is in the upper room of the disciples. He's teaching them about the work of the Holy Spirit. And beginning in verse eight of John 16, he says, and when he, that's the Holy Spirit has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment and then he's going to embellish each one of those points, expand on each one of those three. And in verse 9, of sin, because they do not believe. Now, this is the context of salvation. Uh, is, again, I think there are people to whom Hebrews was written that were not saved. And that's what Jesus is saying in the upper room. The sin. The foundational sin, the fundamental sin, the master sin, is not believing. What a serious thing that is. Christian, don't do that. Don't stop believing. And if you're not a Christian, don't be intellectually convinced and turn your back. Uh, if you're a Christian, that attitude will lead to all kinds of other sins. And again, verse 12, take care, brethren, lest there be in any of you this evil heart of unbelief. Now, you can argue whether that evil heart can exist in a believer. People debate that. But the idea of unbelief is certainly evil if we don't take God at his word. I mentioned this morning that somebody counted all the promises in the Bible. 8,810. Now, I don't know who has the patience to count like that, but somebody did. And uh, let me... I just this I put together this afternoon and, and uh, Jeremiah 29 and verse 11 it says for I know the thoughts that I think toward you says the Lord thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope I wrote that one down because of what was talked about in the breaking of bread this morning the fact that we remember God God remembers us now he does his job a lot better than we do our job but think about that God thinks about us, toward us, peace, not evil. And then one of the most precious promises in all the Bible, Romans 8, 38 and 39, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor power nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And promise after promise after promise. Do we believe them? 
Do we live and think as though we believe them? We don't start the Christian life with faith to leave that faith behind. We live the Christian life by faith. Now, I don't know all of your testimonies, but it's quite likely that uh, some of you may have had glorious, dramatic, exciting stories of your conversion. But as glorious and dramatic as some of those are, um, we can, you know, we come completely out of darkness into his marvelous light, you, you, whatever phrase you want to use. But there are trials in the Christian life that can be just as dark and just as dramatic, and you're forced to ask the question, what do I really believe? What do I really trust? Uh, what really matters to me? Where's my faith? Where's my hope? Where's my trust? Where's my treasure? And the author of Hebrews is saying, when you get to those points in your Christian life, don't stop believing. You enter this life by believing, live the life by believing, believe his promise, his power, his gospel, because we walk by faith, not by sight. We sometimes talk to young people that are headed off to college, and we say, look, you've grown up in a Christian family, a Christian environment, a Christian assembly, and you're going to go someplace where everything you've been taught is going to be questioned. It's going to be criticized. And you're going to ask yourself, what do you really believe? You need to know right now what it is that you believe so that you don't waver when you go away from home, when you go out and live on your own. So important. And then uh, the author, beginning in verse 16, he asks three, uh, it's a barrage really of rhetorical questions. And uh, notice, uh, who is it that heard and yet rebelled? And the answer, wasn't it all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? The only exceptions, Joshua and Caleb, maybe Moses himself, that he did something else that was wrong. Uh, with whom was God angry? Well, wasn't those who sinned? And then to whom did he swear they wouldn't enter into his rest? Those who didn't obey. And it all has to, it all has to deal with this idea of unbelief. Rebellion, sin, disobedience. So we pay attention to the Word of God. We pay attention to the warnings of God. We pay attention to the danger of unbelief. And thirdly, fourthly rather, we want to pay attention to one another. Let me again read verse 13. But exhort one another daily while it is still called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is very deceitful. Uh, Satan will make it look attractive, interesting, fun. We need to encourage one another. And I don't know if you think about this or not, but you realize your encouragement may have that kind of benefit to another Christian. How often do we encourage other Christians to remain faithful? Do we ask them about their prayer life uh, kindly? Do we ask them about the time in the Word of God? We encourage them to keep going. Uh, I'm a rather stoic individual. I, my whole family jokes about coming from this Scottish-English background that is a result of that, not that emotional. You know, you look at Italians and you look at Indian people and they're you know, close together and they're huggy, kissy kind of people and so forth. And uh, we English and Scottish people, not that way at all. And uh, I, years ago when I could still run, uh, was involved in, I think it was a 10K run, and uh, it was around a small town. It was a fundraiser for, I think, you know, a library. And uh, so I get near the end, about a half a mile from the finish line, and uh, there was my sister and a couple of my kids. Uh, my two boys were uh, in the race as well, and uh, these ladies on the porch were saying, keep going, keep running, you're doing well, and all that sort of thing. And, and uh, I thought to myself, this doesn't mean anything to me. I don't care about this. <laughs> I never heard him talk to my boys because they were so far ahead of me that I uh, never heard that. But um, yet, I think for the most part, uh, encouragement like that is meaningful. I can think of other areas of my life. If somebody encourages me, it is so helpful. And uh, I'm going to exaggerate here a little bit, but. If somebody criticizes me, I can be crushed. You know, if I know that I've said something that's hurt other people, I've got into an argument that I shouldn't have, 
I won't sleep for two or three nights, that kind of thing. Think about that when you're talking to other people. We want to be encouraging. And that's the idea here. Exhort one another. Uh, later on in the book of Hebrews, you're going to be told that the reason that we meet together is to exhort one another, to stimulate one another, to provoke one another to love in good deeds. One of the good deeds is believing God, spending time in prayer, reading the Bible and all of that. Don't stop. That's what we tell other people. Uh, don't stop running. Don't stop believing on Jesus. Don't stop trusting the promises of the Bible. My time is gone here again. Um, this, I do think, has application to unbelievers. If there is anybody here that's not a Christian, uh, don't be afraid to ask somebody how you can be a Christian, what it means to be a Christian, what does it take to be a Christian. Uh, it's quite dangerous to walk away from God, and for those of us that are Christians, um, it's hard. It's a jungle out there, you know, that cliche, a wilderness out there. But keep believing. Our Father, we do thank you again for your word, I and mean, we thank you that it is a guidebook for life. It can be a blessing and an encouragement to us. Even if other people don't encourage us, we know that your Holy Spirit does through this word. Now, we thank you for this one that we've looked at. We recognize it as application to us today, and then we pray that you would bless our Christian life and testimony with this. We ask it in his name. Amen. Thank you, Don. Very applicable for the wilderness that we find ourselves in today. In closing, a short little hymn, 513. Oh, how he loves you and me. And let's repeat that. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you and me. 513, the two verses in the meeting will be over. Thank you.